So, hey, uh, how's it going? Um, got a little fun with chromatics for you today. So, a little bit of a technical challenge. We'll talk about some theory, and we'll just kind of break it down and see what else we can do with this seemingly boring scale. Why? Because you're a guitar player, and this is Guitar Amado. Hey everybody, how's it going? Adam Amado here. So today I've got just a little chromatic lick for you. Um, so recently I've been working with a student of mine who's a total beginner, and uh, I've been getting back into the, the four finger exercises, you know, coming up with some exercises for him to just get some finger dexterity going on, right? So a lot of chromatics, you know, I'm kind of thinking in, in terms of that. Uh, I've also been developing a new theory program specifically for guitar players, so uh, my mind is kind of on that chromatic scale sort of thing, all right? So I've been dealing a lot with it, and I figure, hey, let's just make a cool little exercise out of it, but this particular exercise actually s ended up sounding pretty cool. Um, so I decided to just share it here on YouTube. By the way, stick around to the end, and I will uh, give you some tablature for it, okay? But before I do that, I just want to show you three different practice routines that you can get out of this one lick. So to kick things off a little bit, how about a little music theory talk? Now, this being a chromatic scale, there's not a whole lot of theory that we could analyze here. However, I'm kind of basing the entire riff around those two notes. So we got an E flat and a uh, D flat. And harmonically, that would be a D-sharp and a C-sharp. But either way you look at it, we have a, an interval of a minor seventh. So there's some kind of theory that you could analyze here. So the point with that is basically any exercise that you do, there's always at least some theory that you can pull from it. And that's simply analyzing the intervals. That's the, the most basic that you can strip it down. But if we wanted to go a little further and think like, okay, what kind of chord would that use? So maybe an E flat seven chord. Or you could think of it as a D flat nine chord, which would be sort of like this. Yeah, it's got the E flat in it. You know, so you can kind of play around with the intervals that way, too, and think about other chords. You know, maybe you're going to record yourself playing this lick, and you want to think of some chords to play along in the background or something like that. So just always be looking out for those opportunities to spot a little theory in your guitar playing, and it will go a long way. All right, so now let's quickly dive into the technical side of things. So I'll walk through the whole lick and just kind of break down my choices of what I'm thinking about in my fretting hand, in my picking hand. So in a practice setting, this is where you would go through and make your own deliberate choices on, say, what fingers you're using, where your position shifts are, where your string crosses are, where's the trouble spots, where are the challenges in your picking hand. Do you need to change the direction of your pick at all? So these are all things to think about when you're practicing for technique and making decisions in the music that you're either writing or learning or whatever you're doing. All right, so we're starting off in the sixth position. We're using the third finger, so that puts us on the eighth fret. Six, seven, eight. And the reason I'm doing that is so that I can land my fourth finger when I jump down to the first string. And it just kind of eliminates an unnecessary shift there. Then if I would go here. So now i got to shift my hand down the whole time. So it's basically in the name of efficiency. You might make different choices there, and that's totally fine. Continuing on. The next thing I notice here is my pick. It's a string skip going from the third string to the first string. So pretty much the important thing here is to decide what direction you're moving with your pick. So I'm doing two downstrokes with it. I don't know why, that just feels more comfortable to me. Um, I guess, you know, doing a down up, that's not too bad either. So just another decision to make there. Now continuing on. So 
uh, second string, uh, pretty much the exact same thing going on with the first as with the first string, but you don't have those spaces in between the notes. So same fingering, same shift there at the end, and then it just repeats again. And now here it changes to the second half of the riff. Now this part of the lick is just based around this half step string cross here from the eighth fret third string to the fifth fret second string. So one decision you can make there is kind of more of a, an articulation thing is how how much do you want those notes to blend together, if at all? Do you want them completely separate? Or do you want them to kind of ring together a little bit? So yeah, it's a subtle difference, but it could, could mean a lot. But now let's look at the actual turnaround here. So it goes right back into that eighth fret. See? So that little shift there at the end was also a very deliberate decision that I made. So that's just a few like basic thoughts that are kind of running through my head when I'm thinking about technique. So it essentially breaks down into finger choices and pick strokes. You know, if you want to simplify it there. So finally, let's take a look at the third practice routine that you can get out of this one riff and that is creativity right so you could maybe use the exact same notes but try to move them to different spots on the fretboard so I would consider that maybe a cross between technique and creativity because you're still learning the technical side of navigating your fretboard but you're also training your brain to be a little more creative with the way you organize your notes on the fretboard. And then the other side of that is just to completely start over, maybe choose the same like range of notes. So I would consider the range of this chromatic scale, we're essentially not even going to full octave. We're going to minor seventh. So maybe pick those same notes, but see if you can change up the rhythm a little bit or the sequence and get something else that sounds kind of cool out of it. So maybe off the top of my head, like a... So whatever, that was just complete nonsense, just making shit up and having fun. Uh, but how do you think I came up with that original lick? It sounded like shit at first, and I just messed around with it and ironed it out until I had something that was kind of cool. So the point there is just to have like a free-for-all with a chromatic scale, and mainly it has a lot to do with your rhythm and your phrasing there. So it really trains that side of your creativity to, to think in this way. All right, so that's it for this video. The, uh, the sun went down on me, so I lost all my natural light why the shadows look kind of different here. Kind of looks, looks a little cool though, right? <laughs> anyway, um, I'd love to hear back from you, so leave me some comments if you enjoyed this little riff and you think of other interesting ways that you can develop practice routines around the chromatic scale. All right, I will catch you in the next video, and until then, happy practicing. <laughs>